and welcome to Hospice Insights, The Lawn Beyond, where we connect you to what matters in the ever-changing world of hospice and palliative care. Meet the new laws, same as the old laws, overpayment recruitment update. Ryan, hey, Meg. the old is new again. Is that what we're trying to say with this title? Like nothing changes, but they call it new. <laughs> Well, um, that, that's the puzzle here. This is kind of a, an update, an alert, but kind of going through what they have said and what they're proposing for manual revisions. It's the rules that you and I have worked with for years and years. So I, I don't think it's it's new information. I think they're finally updating some of their manuals to reflect what has been the case for quite a long time. So, and... Just a plug for this podcast is brought to you by someone reached out to us with a question about this. And then we said, oh, that would be a great podcast idea because someone reached out and said, oh, have you seen this transmittal? And um, we had. And so then we thought, well, geez, if one person has that question, probably other people have that question. So um Brian, let's get into the nuts and bolts here about what we're talking about. So this MLN matters and there's a transmittal to right, Brian, about um, how when you have these post-payment review audits, how um, overpayments are collected and and specifically about this whole interest thing, right? So that's what we're talking about. So this isn't when you have prepayment TPE, right? Because you don't have any interest. I haven't paid you, but this is when we're dealing with post-pay review audits. So, you know, true smirks, what we call CPI audits, UPICs. That's when, you know, everything we're talking about right now becomes part of um, the conversation. Right, Brian? Yeah, that's right. And I think uh, if, for those of, of you who've been through audits like what you've mentioned, Meg, uh, a standard part of that process, with a few exceptions, is you get a demand letter from your MAC, Palmetto NGS CGS. And those demand letters lay out some of the options that are identified also in these this MLN matters and the change request or manual updates that they provided. So that's where it's familiar territory for you and me. And it kind of provides a little bit more detail about and reiterates what those options are. What do you do when you get this notice yeah. that you owe 5000 or 500000 or $5 million to the government? Exactly. And so the options they give you with the demand letter are you can voluntarily repay, you can allow recoupment, which means they'll take 100% from your billings till they recoup that. And that will begin on the 41st day uh, from the demand letter. You can apply for an extended repayment plan. Um, And so I guess there's this opting for immediate recoupment. I don't know whoever does that. (laughs) Well, actually, I, I talking with a client going through these options, that one seemed attractive to them. The difference between immediate recoupment and involuntary recoupment is a month worth of interest. True, true. Yeah. Because, yeah, uh, involuntary recoupment, they don't recoup until day 41. They tag you with that first month of interest on day 31. Immediate recoupment, they start recouping before any interest accrues. But interesting about where you are in your billing cycle, though, like, you know, depending on how things come up, like if there's nothing to recoup because everything you got paid mid-month, like I wonder if you ask for immediate recoupment, but there's nothing to recoup, does that end up leaving you in the involuntary recoupment <laughs> bucket? But we won't go in down that, <laughs> that rabbit hole. But um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, these are the options that are laid out in this letter that's a very it's all boilerplate kind of stuff and this is what's in this transmittal and it's sort of not new stuff but but i think that where the math comes in and we all know that i am bad at math so any math question (laughs) i go to you brian which doesn't say much but you know (laughs) (laughs) um 
so is this whole calculation of interest, right? So if you allow them to recoup, so this involuntary recoupment, and you said like they're going to start the 41st day, so you're going to have what's called 935 interest, which the rate varies, but it's always usually double digits, like 10, 12 percent. It's currently 12.375 percent. I think they change it quarterly as needed. So really high. So you're going to get charged that interest. So it's five million dollars. You're going to get charged 12.375 interest. Now that assumes that your billings are enough that they could take that all in one foul swoop. Because obviously, if you don't bill enough a month, then that could take several months. So then you're going to have several months of interest. But the point is, if you allow them to recoup and you get charged interest, then if you end up winning at ALJ claims, they have to pay you interest. So if you just pay by check, right, Brian, you don't yeah. get that interest back. So if you, the, the first option, voluntary repayment, which is what we call paying by check, if you do that so you don't get charged any interest, then essentially you don't get interest back even at ALJ if you win claims. Yeah, th that's right. And and these materials make clear that that's the case, and that's always been the case. And, well, I, I shouldn't say always. I think that's been the case since 2003. Um, and you'll see these, these documents make... Uh, reference to that 2003 act which changed things and so 21 years later they finally get into <laughs> updating their manuals but but you're right voluntary repayment immediate recoupment uh you subject to what you said about your billing schedule yeah. you don't pay the government interest but the government doesn't pay you interest if you end up winning some of those claims and get refunds during the appeal process including at the alj the uh, the involuntary recoupment, where you're kind of sacrificing a month of interest, and this is where the math comes in, you're sacrificing that month of interest, but what you can receive, if you win at the ALJ or later, uh, meaning the count, Medicare Appeals Council or federal court, is you get interest back from the government if you win claims. And it is, as you've described it, what they call this 935 interest. That is the interest currently at 12.375%. So you pay that on day 31 um, for for that uh, overpayment. So you're out a bit then, and you just hope to recover and win more claims at the ALJ level months or potentially a year or so down the road, that it all makes financial sense. And you, you kind of do the math to figure out what are your odds of really making this into a beneficial arrangement with that high interest rate. Yeah, well, and I think that... The true person who should be doing the math here is your CFO. Because <laughs> not you, not, not me. Because <laughs> <Yeah. Right. laughs> essentially, this is a hard calculation for me <laughs> um, and taxes you, Brian. But ultimate, like for CFOs, I'm sure like this is like a, a no brainer. You do some formula or something and you figure out if it's all this stuff. Because I, I do think what we still see is that you get the vast majority of your movement at ALJ. So where you're going to win the most amount and therefore likely to be able to get paid the most amount of interest would be at ALJ. Because again, if you pay by check, they're going to sit on your money for, you know, they're going to have it. They're going to, government's arguably going to collect interest on that money and make money off of that. You don't have it. And so you won't get the present value of that money back when you get refunds after ALJ. You're going to get whatever that value of that money was when you paid it, which could be, you know, two years or 18 months ago. Yeah. So an, an example that might illustrate this, I mean, you have a $100,000 overpayment. Uh, you want to kind of hold on to this opportunity to get interest back. So you let day 31 go by. Uh, they're going to get 12% interest on you. If you break that down for one month, it's about, what would it be? One month would be uh, 1%. So $1,000 on day 31 gets added to that. But then you give, but then the government takes it back. And let's say it's nine months later, 
when you get a favorable decision from the ALJ. Well, nine more months uh, is interest at that rate of $1,000 a month or $9,000. And if you win everything at the ALJ, you'll get 100,000 plus 9,000 back. And now it's not ever that neat. I mean, sometimes it is, but we do yeah. get a number of fully favorable uh, rulings. But, but uh, you know, you're sometimes in the middle there where maybe it makes sense, maybe it doesn't. And a big consideration is when you allow recoupment, uh, I mean, they shut off the Medicare payment faucet until all that money is recouped. For $5,000, maybe not a big deal. We're, we're working with clients where it's 32 million, 5 million, you know, 48 million. Uh, that's something that they just can't allow the recoupment yeah. to happen and play this interest game. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think most commonly where we're having the conversation where it's doable are these CPI audits that we talk about, which is the long length of stay reviews that while Noridian does the record review, CMS is really behind those Center for Program Integrity because those, you know, they might come back a million dollars and people might have enough money to, to essentially allow recoupment for that million dollars and still going to be able to make payroll and do all that stuff. And so, um, you know, there there is... So, as you say, this is not an option for everyone, but if you do want to be real savvy and play the numbers game, which I think, to your point, Brian, it's also... And we really try to focus clients on this, too, is what is your strength assessment on these cases? You know, we call it the red, yellow, green. Red isn't not eligible. It's just like, what are stronger, we, you know, stronger to weaker cases? And I think doing that out of the gates and sometimes, you know, clients, you know, it's hard to get their, if their physicians are going to be the expert witness, to get them to put pen to paper on that. But I think it's really helpful for management uh, and leadership to understand, you know, what am I rolling the dice on here? And this is yet another reason, like, if I'm trying to think about playing the interest game here, you know, I want to know what's the likelihood of success and where are we likely to have that success? And, and so I think, you know, none of this is guaranteed. Like, you know, we win cases that are more challenging all the time and we lose cases that are sometimes strong. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's somewhat of a, a crapshoot, but I think putting heads together and you and I do a lot of training on audit response. It's not just a finance issue. It's like working with your clinical team, right? You need a interdisciplinary approach in audits for lots of different reasons. And here's yet another one where, you know, what multiple people contribute to here is um, important because it shouldn't just be finance making this in a vacuum. You need to know what is the strength of the underlying claims. But that, that's exactly right. And that's the other layer of math that goes into this and how you're kind of gambling on yourself or you know, gambling or, or I guess recognizing you have vulnerabilities and not playing this interest game. If you don't have confidence, you're going to win at the ALJ. Maybe it's a high risk appeal and you don't want to go into a high risk appeal paying interest up front because you don't have you know, confidence you're going to ever win that back, but it still makes sense to appeal it. And, and it could be make sense to do that for a number of reasons, including relating to the 60 day repayment rule and other issues that yeah, we've yeah. talked about. So, so yeah, I mean, it's a lot of things to think about. This is a very complex area. Um, and I often, I don't know why I apologize to clients for the complexity <laughs> of this, but, yeah. but, you know, you can only get interest in this one particular way of the five different options or whatever that exists. I mean, what sense does that make? It's it's hard to figure why this is. And just to be clear, we, we've only been talking about the options where you're giving money back to the government early on. The other option is you halt recoupment and you hold on to your money. So we haven't really talked about this, but these new alerts don't really yeah. address that other than to say interest is going to accrue on you. So but we'll, we'll have links or uh, attachments that we'll include in what do we call these? The episode notes. Uh, there's some yep. term for that. Uh, but uh, we'll have the the MLN Matters alert 
we'll have the change request so everybody can look up the proposed changes to the Medicare financial management manual. And they do have some calculation examples. So if your CFO is a true math nerd out there, you can kind of run through some of those examples that uh, are a lot of different scenarios that'll help you do those kinds of calculations. Yeah, well, I think maybe I am always, you know, a stickler for, I should be able to explain complex things simply, right? If you really understand it. And it's like, I can't tell you how many times we've explained this to clients and it's still, I don't think necessarily intuitive and, you know, it takes a while for clients to wrap their head around this because usually, you know, this is a conversation we talk about at the record request stage to just plant the seed because I always talk about what's the runway. Like, I think it's really important when you get these audits for, you know, the leadership team to understand worst case scenario, when is when is money going to likely become due? When are you going to win your most money? And then, you know, thinking through how you might want to make this repayment and when, like, do you want to halt recoupment? I mean, and I think planting that seed early is helpful so people can noodle on this. Because then when you do get the results back and the demand letter, you're not having this conversation sort of for the first time. And hopefully, you know, in the meantime, people have evaluated their finances and stuff. So so bottom line is this isn't new. It remains as complex as it sort of always was. Um, I think, you know, the person who reached out to us was scratching their head because it is sort of confusing. And because it was never written down in the same way, I think, you know, people thought that there was oh, wow, what's changed? And <laughs> I had to read it several times, Brian, because I was like, what am I missing? And then I was like, well, I have to have Brian read this because like, <laughs> am I missing something? Is my middle-aged brain like forgetting? <laughs> like, am I reading? I'm missing like a key word. And then you... Me and my old age it. brain uh, yeah. came in and, my, and the so, wisdom that I have. Yeah, with the group. <laughs> exactly. And you said, no, this is essentially nothing new, but it makes it seem like it's new. So anyway, probably though new to many listeners who, if you haven't had to deal with this before, this might be sort of news to you. Yeah. And, you know, we've had to explain this to clients and, you know, what we have materials to help explain it to clients. I think because they're, they're including more language in the manual, uh, there's more information out there for hospices providers to look at to and read to try to get a better sense of this. And again, those examples I think are going to be helpful. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I, I, this is really putting into writing practices that have been around ever since I've been doing this work. Well, and and maybe the last thing I'll add is when you and I were prepping for this, um, we talked about this is because we've been doing this work a long time, is trying to get your interest back on the back end. So like you end up paying it um, and you're trying to, or, you know, you've allowed them to recoup it. And so you want your money back. <laughs> now I've won. It's been difficult. I mean, now it's it's been a lot of years, but like really difficult sometimes to get them to like, recalculate and get your interest back and you're policing it. And I think, Brian, you mentioned in our prep session about like they need to pay you back your money. What is it within 30 days? And then if they're not paying you back your money, like you get interest, not at this higher level, a lower level interest, because it is sometimes I feel like they've dragged their feet and issuing yeah. repayments to people. Yeah, and there and there hasn't been much for us to go on. So I, I think that's kind of a bright spot here, Meg, uh, is uh, this this gives information, and you, you read it, 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 most of it seems to be directives towards the CMS contractors about what to do, when to do it, how to do it. And in our experience, you can't just sit back and expect this is going to happen. And that was before these came out. I don't think that's necessarily going to change just because these are in writing now. I think you still got to 
monitor the contractors, making sure that they're making the right calculations and they are timely. And this, uh, these additions to this manual are going to allow you and Meg, allow you and I to, to kind of go back and, and hold their contractors' feet to the fire if they don't follow these requirements. Yeah, exactly. Because I feel like in years past, it's been just sort of begging and being a nuisance <laughs> to say, <laughs> issue my money back. But now, you know, there's this, we can point to something. Um, so, yeah, well, healthcare is a complicated business, right? So I just went to a legal education session on the enrollment changes, which, um, you know, validating because it wasn't like, oh, I didn't know this stuff, but you're just like, God, the layers of complexity <laughs> of all the things that, that healthcare providers have to do. And again, hospice in particular, as we've highlighted on other podcasts, are really um, an area of focus for a lot of enrollment changes too. So, you know, it does take a, a, a village and <laughs> yeah. really need a lot of people because there's just a, a lot of complexity in in running a healthcare business these days. So um, anyway, we're always here to help. And again, thank you for the person reaching out and putting this, um, asking the question. So as always, if you have feedback on the podcast or ideas for uh, uh, podcast episodes, you know, please reach out to me. We'd love to hear from you and, and we take that feedback seriously and we'll do a podcast. Person just reached out to us, I think, yesterday. And here we are already. We, you swung, know, in, today. Swung, into, yeah. we swung into action. Uh, we are. That, that's how responsive we are. We are. We have our pulse on the hospice community. Or yeah. no, we have our finger on the pulse on the of pulse. the hospice community. Yeah. So. Um, it's all about the pulse, Brian. Pulse, right. pulse. Yeah. <laughs> So um, awesome. Until next time, Brian. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Meg. Well, that's it for today's episode of Hospice Insights, The Law and Beyond. Thank you for joining the conversation. To subscribe to our podcast, visit our website at hushblackwell.com or sign up wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, may the wind be at your back. Bye.